The first vote last night was on the Lib Dems' fatal motion, rejecting the changes to tax credits outright. Well, this was won comfortably by the government. Just 99 voted in favour of the motion to 310 votes against. Next was an amendment proposed by a crossbench peer, Baroness Meacher, to delay the cuts and send the proposals back to the Commons to consider mitigating action. On this, the government suffered its first defeat, with the motion passed by 307 votes to 277 against. Finally, peers voted on Labour's amendment to stop the cuts until the government designs a compensation scheme for low-paid workers for three years. This motion was also passed, the government losing narrowly with 289 votes for the motion and 272 against. Well, the Conservatives are well short of a majority in the House of Lords, with just 249 peers out of a total of 816. The Lords have been increasingly rebellious in recent years. The Coalition Government suffered almost 100 defeats in the Lords in the last Parliament. And the new Conservative Government has already been defeated 19 times in the Lords in the five months since the general election. But this is the first time in 100 years that the Second Chamber has voted down a financial package backed by the Commons. Here's a taste of yesterday's debate in the House of Lords. <laughs> I have been to see the Chancellor this morning at number 11, and I can confirm that he would listen very carefully were the House to express its concern in the way, in the way that it is precedented for us to do so. My motion clearly leaves the matter in the hands of the elected House. The justification for a delay is that the House of Commons will have a full day debate and a vote on these issues, as I've said on Thursday. I understand that dozens of Conservative backbenchers are urging the Chancellor to adjust the tax credit reforms to protect the most vulnerable. Yes, there have been three votes on tax credits in the House of Commons, won by the Government. But Conservative MPs, not me, say they did not have the information they needed when they voted for the cuts. I hear that many of them are now livid about this. This just is not the case. The fact is there was a vote in the other place last week. There was a clear majority and not a single Conservative member voted in the sense the noble lady is indicating. The point is that this was a budgetary matter and budgetary matters are the prerogative of the elected House. And that is a most important constitutional principle. This was designed to reduce the budget deficit, which everybody agrees has to be eliminated on all sides, by something like four and a half billion pounds. All those arguments pale into insignificance when compared to the greater argument, the argument that the general public, millions of people outside of this House are considering today. That being statements given during the course of the general election and in particular Mr Cameron who deliberately misled the British public and the British public would regard what he said now as a lie, a lie to win a general election. It's not a constitutional crisis, that's a fig leaf possibly disguising tensions in the Commons between members of the government. My Lords, we can be supportive of the government and give them what they did not ask for, financial privilege, or we can be supportive instead of those three million families facing letters at Christmas telling them on average they will lose up to around £1,300 a year. I say to the government that these proposals are morally indefensible. Yeah. It's clear to me, and I believe to very many others, that these proposals blatantly threaten damage to the lives of millions of our fellow citizens. a flavour of last night's debate in the Lords that preceded those votes. Well, I'm joined now by the Lib Dem peer, Paul Tyler, and the constitutional expert, Vernon Bogdanor. Welcome to both of you. Vernon Bogdanor, is talk of a constitutional crisis overblown? 
There are very serious constitutional problems. Firstly, with the Lords rejecting a financial instrument, which, as you said a few moments ago, hasn't been done for over 100 years. But secondly, the larger question of whether the fact that the Labour and Liberal Democrat peers outnumber the Conservatives enable the Lords to become no longer a revising chamber, but an oppositional chamber, which is not appropriate for an unelected House. Right, but it's not appropriate. You've changed, actually, what the basic role of the House of Lords is. Look, the Chancellor bungled this. If he wanted to keep it as a financial measure, he could have either, as David Davies said just a few minutes ago here, he could have either have amended the Finance Bill, which would have remained firmly in the Commons, or he could have introduced a tax credit amendment bill, which was made absolutely clear during our debate yesterday. What he did do was to try and get a shortcut, to put it into secondary legislation, which we have every right in the House of Lords, repeat it endlessly. It doesn't matter what the subject matter is. I've got it here in our companion, our, our orders. We have every right to vote down an SI. How do you argue with that? It's not unlawful for the Lords to reject regulations but they do it very rarely precisely because the Parliament Act, which restricts the powers of the Lords, does not apply to regulations because when it was passed in 1911 there was very little secondary legislation. But precisely because the Lords have this supreme power over regulations, they ought to use it as an unelected chamber very, very rarely. It's a kind of nuclear option. And in fact, until recently, until the 1960s, the Lords never rejected a regulation and since then very, very sparingly. And it makes it even more serious when it's on a financial matter on which the privilege of the Commons is absolute. In terms of reviewing the Lords, this rapid review that has been used by the government, what are the options available to them? There's talk of swamping the Lords mm. with Conservative peers. I think that would be foolish, particularly when the government is intending to reduce the size of the House of Commons. It's a bit odd to reduce the size of the elected chamber and increase the size of the unelected chamber. I think the right thing to do would be to put the conventions on financial privilege into statute law so that the Lords would be precluded by law from doing what it did last night. Would you support that? And do you agree it wouldn't be a good look to swamp the House of Lords with 100 or 150 Tory peers to end the fact that they don't have a majority? Well, it is the nuclear option. I think the difficulty the government faces is that um, if it decides instead to pass primary legislation to limit the Lords' ability to uh, delay legislation, um, uh, to include statutory instruments, um, uh, then uh, the Lords could then vote against that. They could use the Labour and Lib Dem majority to vote against that. The government would then have to invoke the Parliament Act. The whole thing could take about two years. And in the meantime, the government's legislative programme, for which it's won a clear mandate, would be frustrated by the unelected chamber. So that would be the argument for flooding the Lords. So do you think drastic action should be taken? I think it remains to be seen. I think uh, uh, the Lords ha haven't just... Uh, it's not just what they did yesterday. Last week, they breached the Salisbury Convention as well when they rejected the proposal to end subsidies for onshore wind farms, which, again, uh, was uh, unprecedented. Right. But that's I mean... actually nonsense. The Salisbury Convention was killed off in 2006. A joint committee said it was obsolete and both houses agreed. But can I come to this point? We keep hearing about the unelected Lords. The coalition government brought forward a bill to deal with this issue. And as Ken Clark has said, the obvious thing for the government now to do is to deal with that part. You've heard it endlessly round this table today. Unelected chamber, unelected chamber. Well, OK, let's get true. back to that bill. <laughs> Ken Clark says the 2012 bill, which had a large majority in the House of Commons, but then was stymied by a combination of Labour rebels and Tory rebels. So are you effectively admitting you're taking advantage of this situation in order to try and advance a Lib Dem proposal which was rejected in the last Parliament? It wasn't a Lib Dem proposal, it was the coalition government's proposal supported by the Prime Minister and indeed the Chancellor. But it was at the, at the insistence and, no, of no, the No, no, not at all. It was, it was in the Conservative manifesto to do just that. That's where we ought to be going. We ought to be having a review of the relationship between the two houses. This particular issue is, as I have just explained, entirely because the Chancellor was trying to take a shortcut. OK, but we should use the opportunity to think better about the two relationships between the two houses. in the, the meantime, until the House of Lords becomes an elected chamber, if that's what you want, how can you justify unelected peers rejecting something which was clearly in the Conservative manifesto, such as the proposal to abolish subsidies for onshore wind farms? That is, wasn't the issue. 
The issue was, was it important that the House of Lords ask the House of Commons to think again, which is absolutely critical to our Constitution. The whole idea of having two Houses of Parliament is that there should be a second look at issues of this sort. Right. I believe that's extremely it, important. I mean, is it a problem that uh, Tory governments, majority Tory governments, aren't necessarily used to having uh, a case where they're not the majority in the House of Lords? I understand that certainly during Tony Blair's time that there were quite a lot of uh, defeats and there certainly have been fatal motions in the past to kill off legislation, that this is just the real politique of having two houses here and they do have the well, right to yeah. flex their muscles. Let's put aside whether this was a strictly financial uh, matter or not. That's how it works. Well, when, when the Conservatives had a majority um, in the House of Lords because of the number of Conservative mm. uh, hereditary peers, they were very careful not to abuse that oh. uh, when there was a Labour government in order not to undermine the legitimacy of the House of Lords. But Labour and the Lib Dem peers, now that they have a majority, have not been so certain. I mean, With the support, of course, of the crossbenchers last night, very important. Mm. Because we have independent members of the House of Lords who are not members of any party, one one of the successful amendments was, was uh, moved by a crossbencher, Lady Dimitri. Right, but your leader, Tim Farron, has described the Lords, as have other Liberal Democrats, wholly undemocratic. You're not democratically accountable, as you yourself said. You want an elected chamber, but you are frustrating the will of an elected government. That in itself appears hypocritical at the very least. It's the facts of political life. That is our job. That's why we're there. What's the point of having a second house with these particular responsibilities that we are supposed to be there to look at these issues when they're put before us? If the Chancellor didn't want to put these issues before us, he had other routes that he could take. He bungled it. Are you overstepping the mark? Are you overreaching yourselves? And in the end, you will bring about a head-on collision here with the Commons. I think it'll be extremely important that Mr Cameron, who has kept his counsel on what will be the effective way to deal with this issue, how he comes forward with proposals for the long-term reform of the House of Lords. Any tinkering would be absurd at this stage. We have to do what they themselves committed themselves before in two elections, and that was wholesale reform of the House of Lords. Do you agree with that? I think Paul Tyler's right to say that this raises the whole issue of the relationship between the Commons and the Lords, and it raises again the issue of whether we should have an elected House of Lords. Now, an elected House of Lords would have powers that the unelected House of Lords doesn't have, but that wouldn't solve all the constitutional problems. Indeed, it could worsen them. For example, in Australia, you had a huge constitutional crisis between the elected Senate and the elected lower house in 1975 because the elected Senate refused to vote supply, refused to give the government funds. And it ended very controversially when the Governor-General sacked the Prime Minister. Now, the question is, do we want these kinds of conflicts mm. here? And on what basis would the upper house be elected? The Liberal Democrats say it would be on a federal basis. But the problem is Britain isn't really a federal state. We've got parliaments in Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland, but not in England. Right. Do you think the government's got the appetite for, for that again, the, the sort of programme <coughs> of reform to the Lords? I think the likeliest way in which they'll deal with these... Uh, troublesome uh, lords Sounds is, a bit to, sinister. is to, is to uh, introduce a bill in which they limit the powers of the lords even further and if the lords reject that to invoke the parliament. And there you was, can understand why though, can't you? Because actually, you know, it wasn't just yesterday. There have been other examples and this evening you're putting forward yes. another fatal motion, yes. you know, which actually kills off legislation. Well, we're, we are asked specifically by parliament to do so. It's a quite different to the circumstances of last night because it's our job to do just this right. by is law, it, in is, statute. Right. Is that true? Because this is to do with individual electoral registration. Um, and your Liberal Democrat colleague, Baroness Hamwe, has her own fatal motion on cuts to asylum seeker benefits. I mean, is it the right of the unelected House to do this? The Lords can survive only if it exercises a sense of self-restraint. It mm. can ask the government to think again. That's absolutely right. But if a determined government wants to proceed, the Lords has to give way. It shouldn't go beyond that. There's a great danger, I believe now, that the Labour and Liberal Democrat peers are using it as a chamber of opposition, mm -hmm. having lost the election, yeah. trying to frustrate government policy through the upper house. What do you say to that? I mean, it, that's what it'll look like. Eight MPs, no standing really um, in the House of Commons in terms of exerting uh, opposition. This is where you can do it. 
the practical politics is that it is our job mm. to ask the government to be. But are you doing it with such relish because no, you can? No, then, no uh, not. I was uh, involved in the House of Lords before this government, and we have had to do this job regularly, both with the coalition government and the previous. I think you then, can look forward to more of this. Well, then, Paul, all you're saying is we've just asked the government to think again. Well, if the government does think again and comes back with more or less the same proposal to reform our tax credit system, will you then accept it? Well, I don't think it'll come to us because it'll either be dealt with with a, 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 some amendment, a specific bill, or an amendment to the finance. Can I just make I this point? To Briefly. The uh, Treasury were briefing last week that the House of Lords should be suspended. Now, frankly, the last person who tried to stop a House of Parliament doing its job was, of course, King Charles I. I think a little respect for history would show that that wasn't a clever thing to do. He lost his head. Well, that wasn't recent, of course. But anyway, thank you very much for that slightly ominous end. Um, now, <laughs> Jeremy Corbyn has struck a deal with the Scottish Labour leader, Kezia Dugdale, allowing the party in Scotland more autonomy. It's a controversial plan to turn around the party's fortunes in Scotland after they lost all but one of their seats at the general election. Kezia Dugdale addressed Labour MPs at their weekly meeting in the Commons last night and our Scotland political correspondent Tim Reid had an ear to the door. What did they say? Well, she certainly got polite applause at the beginning of her address and at the end. There were some questions uh, during it, though, from MPs who were concerned that uh, autonomy for the Scottish Labour Party may mean that the United Labour Party, the Unionist Labour Party, uh, comes to an end. She says that is not the case and that uh, this is about devolution and not division of the, the UK party. There were also questions from uh, some MPs about the policy diversions that this, uh, this may mean in future, for instance, on... Uh, Issues like uh, defence, the nuclear deterrent for, uh, for, for one, and uh, taxation, uh, which is another issue which may, in the end, mean that Scotland and the rest of the UK Labour Party have different policy um, positions. Now, uh, they, MPs who emerged from that meeting did not seem entirely convinced that they had heard everything that they needed to do to, to about this. But Kevin Dugdale's uh, pitch to them was that um, if uh, Labour's fortunes are to be turned around in Scotland in time for next May's uh, Scottish elections, that she needs more autonomy for the party and that she needs to be able to set policy positions uh, to decide on candidates and not be a branch office of London, which, of course, one of her predecessors, yes. Joanne Lamont, uh, accused the party of being. If this and these changes are to go ahead, how would it, how would it actually work then in practice in terms of setting up a, if you like, a, a different party in Scotland to the rest of the UK's Labour Party? Well, Kezia Dugdale, I think, will argue that it is not a, a different party. It is, it is uh, simply a, a devolution of the, the party. It wouldn't be completely independent, she says, uh, but it would have control over its affairs, over policy positions that it would be able to decide at party conference its position, which may well be different uh, to uh, the UK party's position. Now, MPs were not convinced that they have all the answers to that last night. She says that we'll have to go uh, to the NEC, to the Scottish executive, and also a special conference before it is approved. But she signed that deal with Jeremy Corbyn, a statement of intent, uh, and they say that is uh, the, the road down which they think uh, they want to go, despite the concerns of some in the party. Tim Reid, thank you. And the Scottish Labour leader, Kezia Dugdale, joins us now from Edinburgh. Kezia Dugdale, just listening to that, you want more autonomy for the Labour Party in Scotland. Has that been prompted by the Labour Party swapping one North London leader for another? No, I would say it's been caused by the fact that we lost all but one of our seats in the general election and it's my job as a new leader here in Scotland with a huge mandate to turn around the fortunes of my party to listen to that very strong message that the people of Scotland sent us. And there is a perception, fair or otherwise, that for too long the Scottish Labour Party was run from London by Westminster mm. and that simply has to change. That's why I've made the case for a more autonomous Scottish Labour Party so that decisions around our policy positions, the direction that we take, are made here in Scotland by me and my team. I think that's what voters across Scotland would expect. Now, I've taken that message down to the Parliamentary Labour Party to say very loudly and very clearly, this is not an independent Labour Party. I didn't spend two and a half years campaigning for a no vote and a referendum to argue the case for a separate party. This is about the party of devolution, the Labour Party, devolving power within its own structures. Right. And I think it's high time that we took up that opportunity. Right. Well, we'll come on to some of the policy um, decisions that you might have to uh, go your separate way on. But first of all, sticking with Jeremy Corbyn, I mean, he's been 
the MP for Islington North since the early 1980s. I mean, you would accept he's hardly going to be any more popular in Scotland than Ed Miliband was and doesn't really have any connection to Scottish Labour, does he? I think you've made a very rash judgment there about Jeremy Corbyn. I mean, the reality is that since both Jeremy and I won our um, respective leadership contests, the party membership in Scotland is on the up. We now stand at 30,000 members and Do you think that's down to Jeremy Corbyn? I think it's a combination of the both of us putting forward radical plans to turn around the fortunes of our party. And, mm. you know, I enjoy working with him. I look forward to doing more work with him. But the reality is that I simply have to set out a different path here in Scotland to determine policies and decisions in the Scottish interest. That is about strengthening the UK Labour Party, actually. You know, Tim Reid's package there referred to the strong difference between something which is an act of devolution and something which is viewed as division. This is entirely about that principle of devolution the idea of getting more power into Scotland so we can determine our own fortunes here, and I think that's a thoroughly good move. Do you agree with your predecessor, Joanne Lamont, that Scottish Labour has in the past been treated like a branch office? As I said to you in my opening remarks, there is no doubt that that is a very strong perception that people have in Scotland. This is not about what politicians think. It's actually what's happening on the doorsteps in the communities across the country. We were sent a thumping message in May. We have to get that message. We have to reform and renew our party. Now, I won the leadership election here in Scotland with 72% of the vote with a mandate to do exactly this, to make a more autonomous Scottish Labour Party. But my mandate is much broader than that. I also promised to re-democratise the party. And we go into our conference this weekend with a really lively programme to do things a bit differently. I'm excited about that. I'm also excited to lay out my radical platform for how I intend to transform this country. Right. But let's talk about one of the policy issues, because what happens when you disagree with Jeremy Corman, John sure. McDonnell, for example, on a policy over a non-devolved issue, on Trident, for example? What happens then? Well, as I've just said to you, I have a mandate from the party membership here in Scotland to re-democratise our conference. And I am welcoming the prospect that there may be a debate on Trident at our conference this weekend. Sure. But now, what happens if you end up with two different policies? Come the next general election, sure. voters electing a Scottish MP are faced with a Labour candidate who will be standing uh, for a party with two different positions on a key policy. How does that work? I do understand your question and I've faced this a number of times over the past few days. Forgive me just for saying that you're focusing in on a hypothetical here which we may face four or five years down the line, but let me answer your question very specifically. We are going to create the space for our party membership to have a debate on this particular issue this weekend. Should it be the case that in five years' time, hypothetically, that we are in a different position from the rest of the UK party, then like many other countries across Europe that operate a more federal type solution, there'll be a process for working through that. This is not new in terms of being a concept. We will have new the for the Labour Party. Place. Well, we will have the procedures in place to work through that. Now, I signed a statement of intent with Jeremy Corbyn yesterday about the direction of travel, a relationship between the Scottish Labour Party and the UK Labour Party. There is now, I hope, prospect for a debate across the whole of the UK Labour movement about might what happened in Wales, what might happen across England and the other parts of the country. The end point of this, of course, would be next year's party conference where any real changes might take place. That's yes. 11 months where various stakeholders, if you like, MPs, MSPs, right. party members, unions, can come to the fore and talk about how we might want to resolve the very rare occasions where positions might be conflicting. OK, well, you say they're rare occasions and you say you've got time. That is absolutely true. Did you put pressure on Jeremy Corbyn and John McDonald to change their position on the fiscal charter, for example? That's happened. I spoke to them, yes, I put forward uh, my views on that issue. Mm. Uh, I don't profess to say that, um, that my view was the one thing that, that changed their mind or took them in a different direction. But you but did say to them, and I paraphrase here, something like, you know, probably quite rightly, that uh, if they didn't change their minds, it would be explosive as far as you were concerned in Scotland and the SNP would make hay. No, I didn't use those words. I did make the case for why the Labour Party needed a very strong anti-austerity measure, one which Jeremy Corbyn and John McDonnell were very warm to. That would be of a, no great surprise to you. But can Except also it, wasn't say to you, think, it wasn't their position, though, was it? Originally? Well, you know, there were a few machinations around that, and it wasn't exclusive to the Labour Party. The SNP have had three different positions on the Charter of Budget Responsibility. But let me put it to you this way. Uh, I have regular conversations with colleagues and friends across the whole of the Labour movement. I'm in direct contact with Jeremy Corbyn and Tom Watson and the rest of his team all of the time. We are part of the one 
party, the one movement. We, we are determined to turn around the fortunes of the Scottish Labour Party and to build a Labour Party that's fit oh. for the future. I, mean, I see are, that as a massive opportunity. So the principle there, of devolution must apply here. You say there'll be only rare instances. I mean, which areas of policy do you think uh, you'll need the freedom to disagree with the National Party? Well, look at, look at the example that we're going to face in the next few weeks around tax credits and, and welfare reform. Very soon we'll know what degree those powers are coming to the Scottish Parliament, but I would like to be in a position to set out the ability to use these new powers and design a welfare system, a security system in Scotland that protects people here in Scotland based on their needs. Now, I will have the freedom to do that. That's a thoroughly good thing. But when you disagree, Likewise, when when you disagree with the leader of the Westminster Party, how will Scottish MPs vote in Parliament? Well, I've just talked you through this, Joe. I've said that this is an 11-month process yeah, right. where we will create the space to work out how we will work through these processes where there might be a conflict. But the principle is an incredibly sound one. Okay. This is fundamentally about devolution. And if I just point out to you, the Labour Party has had differing positions on education for, for 16 or more years sure. now. You know, we but have devolved, different policy. But, and yeah, these are, devolved, these are devolved issues. It's, re it's really where well, these the things are... The principle is the same. Yeah, though. well, it is different if you've got a non-devolved issue. Um, but, I mean, looking at your predecessors... Um, as leader of Scottish Labour, uh, not been easy. Wendy Alexander, uh, Joanne Lamont, Jim Murphy, they presided, would you say, over the party during a period of decline. What, what makes you different? Well, look, I, I understand uh, how big a task there is ahead. Um, I wasn't, you know, unaware of that when I put my name forward for this job, but I love my party and I believe that it has a bright future. I think the values of the Labour Party are as relevant now as they have ever been. The big challenges and the opportunities of the future can be realised by Labour values and that's why I put my name forward for this job because I want to turn around the fortunes of my party. You know, I've worked with a number of Labour leaders at co close quarters. I've seen many of these events that you describe at close hand and, and I've learned from that and all of those people that you name, I would still call friends and close colleagues who provide me with advice and I also know that I'm not alone I have a very strong team of MSPs here in the Parliament a, a growing movement of party members and supporters across the country who believe in my party and its values and believe that it has the answers to nationalism and we're going to set out some of those bright ideas for the future this coming weekend at our party uh -huh. conference I'm incredibly upbeat and optimistic about my party's future isn't it the reality though that voters in Scotland now they've experienced devolution see the SNP as far more effective at bashing the Westminster government and getting more for Scotland than Labour. And I think they will continue, uh, some people think, to vote in the SNP up in Scotland and, well, differently down at Westminster, obviously. But that that will be the situation. What a travesty to assume that the one purpose of the SNP is to bash a government in Westminster. We sit in an incredibly powerful parliament just 500 metres from where I am sat right now. You know, £30 billion pound budget, powers over health and education, more welfare powers, tax powers, tremendous powers to transform the life chances of people the length and breadth of this country. And after eight years of the SNP government, the gap in our schools between the richest pupils and the poorest is as wide as it's ever been. 6,000 pupils leaving primary school unable to read properly. A flagship hospital in Scotland where right. one in four people have to wait more than four hours to be seen in an A&E department. This record of the SNP government simply has to be exposed and understood across the whole of the United Kingdom. All right. It's about far more than Westminster grievance. Kezia Dugdale, thank you very much. Toby Young. I think the problem the Corbynistas have is that they said during Jeremy Corbyn's election campaign that the reason Labour fared so badly in Scotland last May is because they didn't embrace the same anti-austerity politics that the SNP did. Um, actually, now that Corbyn is leader, it doesn't look as though Labour's going to fare any better in the Scottish regional elections next year. Well, um, uh, we'll the, have to see. Of course, the Tories uh, don't have any really footing either. It, look, it, look, it looks like Labour's going to be wiped out and Corbyn, being the leader, will make no difference. So they have to... I think this, to me, feels like a bit of advanced damage control. They will say, we're intending to devolve part of the Scottish Labour Party. We let Kezia run that campaign. It's her fault. It's not a reflection on us, so don't kick us out as a result. All right. The Labour leader, Jeremy Corbyn, isn't short of critics in the right-wing press, in the left-wing press, in the Conservative Party, in the Labour Party. And now he's got some in the Middle East. Yesterday, he was singled out by the Saudi Arabian ambassador after the Ministry of Justice scrapped a £6 million deal to provide prison services to the kingdom. Mr Corbyn had spoken out against the deal and took credit for the U-turn but was accused of breaching respect by Mohammed bin Nawaf bin Abdul Aziz. Here's the message Jeremy Corbyn delivered to David Cameron during his conference speech last month. 
intervene now, personally, with the Saudi Arabian regime to stop the beheading and crucifixion of Ali Mohammed al namar <laughs> who is threatened, threatened with the death penalty for taking part in a demonstration at the age of 17. And, while you're about it, terminate that bid made by our Ministry of Justice to provide prison services for Saudi Arabia, which would be required to carry out the sentence that would be put down on Mohammed Ali Anamar. Although many might agree with Mr Corbyn, is it unwise to upset one of our most important allies in the Middle East? Well, Conservative MP Alan Duncan thinks so, though journalist James Bloodworth says we shouldn't be shy about human rights. They both join me now. Um, did Jeremy Corbyn influence the Prime Minister's decision to cancel the Saudi prison training contract? I don't know. I don't think so. But I actually wish we'd rather stuck with the contract because I think that if we can be involved in reforming their prisons, it's a good thing. Uh, we have someone who was supposed to be going to be lashed. I don't think it was ever going to happen, but that's what all our local headlines said. And if we were part of that, we'd probably in a, be in a much better position to influence some of their judicial decisions. The bigger issue, though, is that the whole of the Middle East is a mess. And if you just have this megaphone self-righteousness, you risk making it messier. And the Saudi regime is actually far more moderate than their own people. And if you want to bin the regime and replace it with a sort of non-democratic ISIS all over Saudi Arabia, you would very, very quickly regret having done that. Do you think those actions risk making it messier, the situation in relations with Saudi? Um, well, it, I guess it depends how far you go. I don't think we should advocate overthrowing the, the government in Saudi Arabia. I think it's just I would like to see less of the kind of obsequious nature, obsequious treatment of the Saudi royal family by the government. So we had the half flying of the of the British flag um, when King Ab Abdullah passed away. Um, Saudi Arabia is the largest arms market for for, Brit for British uh, arms companies, and I think Jeremy Corbyn's um, right to draw attention from that to that. I think his, but at the same time, I think his he has his own problem with a lack of consistency in that he stands on platforms with with um, outfits which su supported by the Iranian government and is also soft on on Putin's Russia. So I think it's about consistency. Right. I mean, sticking then with Saudi Arabia, I mean, you, you say that this megaphone politics isn't anything that could prevent uh, the abuse of human rights or the lashing of a young boy or a grandfather. Isn't anything that stops that a good thing? Oh, I'm not saying one shouldn't say, talk about it, discuss it, tell them what you think in private. All I'm saying is that the simplistic grandstanding we heard from Jeremy Corbyn, like, let's intervene to stop this lashing is total fantasy. And what you've got to be here is realistic. And you've got to be realistic about the nature of regimes in that part of the world, their history, what you can and cannot change, and what would replace what is there now if there were a vacuum that needed to be filled. Right. Aren't, That's you, where you've got to be realistic. aren't you tiptoeing around the regime here somewhat, Alan Duncan? No, I think you need a lot of understanding about the nature of Saudi society, both the people themselves, but also the nature of the regime, where they do actually rule with a measure of consent in the sense that if they don't have collective approval they're very quickly replaced and there are quite a lot going on even now within the regime which we will not know about which is straining a lot of the stability we are seeing. What sort of relationship should we have <coughs> with Saudi Arabia? Well I have <coughs> many of the same reservations that James has about uh, human rights abuses in Saudi Arabia, the fact that women aren't allowed to drive, that bloggers are routinely uh, prosecuted and in some cases flogged and so forth. But I think the risk of withdrawing from our relationship with Saudi Arabia and not entering into any trade with them at all is that we lose any possible positive influence we might have. But I right. think I think a, 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 me a measured, mm. uh, qualified uh, response is probably better than all in favour or all out of Right, OK. Well, Pretty taking much. that view on the, on the prison training contract, was it right to drop that? I think it was right, given, given how unjust the Saudi judicial system is. Yes, I mean, on that particular point, what was wrong with pulling out of that? Because people would have read that as, as us, if you like, being involved, even at a, a distance, to some of the abuses that go on in the prisons. It's a very difficult decision about whether to become involved or not with a, with a regime like that. And when I was a DFID minister, you know, we tried to have a lot of programmes to improve the judicial process in countries in Africa and elsewhere and things like that. You could say, don't go anywhere near them because it's a messy process, or... Try 
try and get in there and make it better. It's a, d a difficult moral call. That's why it's a moral decision. And absolutism in these issues, as actually I agree with Toby, is actually the bad position to hold. James, would things change dramatically under a, a Jeremy Corbyn leadership? I, th I think so. Um, if if he, he, he does win, uh, it's looking unlikely at this point, but if he does win a general election, I think but I think it, things would change. But I think the danger then is that things would go too far the other way. So you'd, you'd lose some of the cooperation with Saudi Arabia on issues like Bashar al-Assad, on terrorism. And then I think Jeremy Corbyn would, would be too soft on, on countries like Iran and uh, Russia. I mean, that's another side of, of this other like human rights abusing coin, if you like. You've worked in the oil industry in the past. Saudi Arabia obviously is the world's biggest oil producer. Does it just come back to oil and money? No, but oil is a global commodity. You know, it doesn't matter what we say to Saudi Arabia, in a sense. Uh, if oil prices go up or down, it's the same for everybody. So there's no private direct benefit that comes from talking about oil with Saudi Arabia. There's no special flow or special supply at a special price. Right. It's equal misery or equal so what's pricing. The so what's the point, then, of the sort point, of flattering them and keeping them on side? The point is that the Middle East uh, matters to us. It, of course, oil does matter. Just try doing without it. But for us to be in the mix there with Gulf countries and roundabout like Yemen and of course the nearer Middle East with, with, with Palestine and Israel, it's essential, I think, that we are a respected and effective voice in the mix. And if we withdraw by just saying you're all bad, little Britain becomes smaller. Does it make any difference on terrorism? Um, I think it, it probably does make sense. I mean, we're not privy to all the information. I think it does make some, but at the, at the same time, mm -hmm. Saudi, Saudi Arabia spreads Wahhabi ide ideology around the world and helps to promote extremism. It has done in the past in places like Afghanistan. Oh. It is today in, place, in somewhere like... But Syria. not I've the regime. Very, but I've not got the to regime. very quickly get to the quiz. Can you remember the question? Uh, celebrity peer, apparently flown in from New York to vote in last night's debate. Which one of these four was it? Andrew Lloyd Webber. It was Andrew Lloyd <laughs> Webber. I, I love the idea, though, of him being flown in all the way from New York, had a sort of glamour about it. Well, I mean, <laughs> I, I, people have criticised him, saying he's gone to these great lengths in order to vote for the tax credit cuts. But, you know, the Conservatives had a whipping operation. All they right. carried it out efficiently. They had to do that in response to the whipping of the, of the Lib Dem and the Labour peers. You've got it in. That's it from us. Bye-bye. <laughs>